So very good evening, and we are covering uh, a series, uh, Do Business and Be Successful the Bible Way Until I Come. Uh, what we want to see is everything that pertains to life and godliness. The kingdom is a business. Jesus said, occupy or do business until I come. Family is a business. You are raising children together uh, in your place of work, your career. You are always in business with God and with someone. Uh, you Basically, you are serving someone else. So we've been uh, looking at the secrets uh, uh, that... Um, um, revealed to us through the Bible how to be uh, in business with God, one another, and be successful uh, the Bible way in Jesus. Now, you can call them principles or you can call them secrets. Uh, it's up to you. I decided to call them secrets. So we studied secret one and secret two, and we started the secret, secret three, which was the ability to transform ourselves uh, from a caterpillar to a butterfly, the ability to transform ourselves from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Point number one was a metaphor, a metamorphosis. And point number two uh, was uh, you no longer see yourself as a grasshopper, but as a giant killers. And point number three was don't uh, play the victim. Point number four was to lay the past to rest forget the things that are behind. So that's where we stopped uh, last Wednesday. And today we are going to continue with uh, secret number two. Uh, that's part, secret, secret number three, part two, the ability to transform ourselves from the caterpillar to the, uh, the butterfly. Now, point number five, that's what we are saying today. Point number five, pain is a temporary things will change. So I'll say again, point number five, pay is temporary, things will change. Hallelujah. Pain is temporary, things will change. In your life, things are going to change. In your marriage, things are going to change. In your career, things are going to change. With your children, things are going to change. Second Corinthians chapter Four, verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. The Bible says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Why? For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Hallelujah. So the things that are, instead of you focusing on your temporal situation, the little argument that you are having in your home, the little uh, dis uh, disagreement you are having with your siblings or with your children, don't focus on that. Put your eyes on Jesus. Look through the cross. Look through the pain and see already the things that God is going to establish in your life. God, contrary to Satan, whatever Satan gives to you, it is ephemeral. Uh, uh, and uh, something that is ephemeral is something that is a short lived. A fly, for instance, Belzebub, the master of flies, a fly is uh, in the family of uh, ephemerals, meaning it does not live more than two days. So that's why many people tell, but they, they magnify the devil too much. Jesus said, with the little finger of God, that will crush out Belzebub, the master of flies. So when you see a fly making so much noise, zzz, 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 you truly don't need to bother yourself because within two days, even without you doing anything, that fly is going to die. So Satan and whatever he does, he is always ephemeral. But God, what he does is long-lived. Ephemeral, another, another word for ephemeral is uh, short-lived. Uh, but God, what he does is enduring. Whatever God does in your life is uh, enduring. He's established for a long time. The Bible tells us in the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 18, riches and honors are with me. That's what God says. Enduring riches 
and righteousness. So whatever God gives you is enduring. For a little while, you may suffer, you may go through pain, but the ultimate end is going to be something that is good, something that is going to, long, to be long-lived in the mighty name of Jesus, not something that is uh, ephemeral in the name of Jesus. So believe that uh, whatever you are going through right now, it is not going to be your end. God wants to transform that situation from so that something that is so ugly, like the caterpillar, to something that is so beautiful, like a butterfly in Jesus' name. He's going to give you beautiful ashes, the oil of gladness for a spirit of heaviness. That's what he promised. So pain is part of the process of transformation. You should not be afraid of pain. When push comes to shove, people are now are put in front of the responsibility. What are they going to do? Unfortunately, what people decide to do is to bail out. Don't, you don't need to bail out. When push comes to shove, you need to take your responsibility and go through the process of transformation because the transformation is never painless. It's always a pain, uh, painful. And like I told you last Wednesday, that actually the caterpillar inside that uh, cocoon, cocoon melts down. So you are going to melt down to be dissolved like a fire, like wax before fire. And the, the process is not uh, pleasant. It is uncomfortable to be in co under constant heat. But that's part of the transformation process. Anyone that wants a life that is painless, a marriage that doesn't have a friction, of course, it's not going to be forever. There is a time of adjustment. But don't run away from adjustment because there are two different people that are coming together. The same way also with God. There are two different people that are coming together. Isaiah chapter 55 from verse 9 to verse 11. Isaiah chapter 55 from verse 9 to verse 11. God says, your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. Just like the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than uh, your thoughts. Just like the rain comes down from heaven and the snow, but that they do not return uh, to heaven without causing... Uh, the, the grass to board to, uh, without God also giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So is my word also that has gone out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that for which I have sent it. So God is saying to us, has a superior way of thinking. So someone needs to change and that the change is not going to be painless. And also when we come together with the fellow humans, we need to find a way to live together in peace and in harmony. There would be an adjustment on both parties and it is never painless. It is never frictionless, hallelujah. So transform, uh, pain is also part of the process of a transformation in the name of Jesus. Sometimes you are going to change completely and become a different person. And many times we fail to succeed because we don't want to go through the process of transformation. So the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter five, verse eight, Hebrews chapter five, verse eight, talking about the Jesus, hallelujah. He says, though he was a son, okay, he's the son of God, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So even Christ Jesus had to learn obedience because he came in this suit of a uh, uh, human being. So he had to learn also how to submit to God, though he's equal to God, he relinquished his uh, throne, he, he relinquished his uh, power and operated on earth as a righteous uh, man in full obedience to his heavenly Father, though, like Paul says, he's equal to God. He did not consider it a robbery to be equal to God. In marriage, as well, the two partners are equal in that marriage. They are both creating an image of God. Yet, for the structure to work properly, there needs to be submission uh, to God, first of all, submission to one another, uh, so that the thing can uh, work. So it is not always uh, painless. It is most of the time when we obey sometimes God, it is uh, painful. So he learned obedience for the things which he suffered. Now, 
the, the needs to be disciplined if in our life, if we need to be uh, transformed. God will put a discipline in our life. Uh, we need to in, uh, have a self-imposed uh, discipline in every aspect uh, of life. And that discipline is not uh, pleasant uh, at first. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9 to verse 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9 to verse 11. He says, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us. God is going to correct us. Like I said in the past, in the book of a proverb, that for us Christian correction and instruction is the way of life. Only a fool despises correction. So if the person is despising correction, correction according to the word of God. Because some people, they just want to give you the opinion that has nothing to do with the written word of God. That correction that we are talking about or those instructions that we are talking about, they must line up with the counsel of the Holy Scriptures, not with the opinions of people. People can keep their own opinion to themselves in the name of Jesus. We don't want to hear people's opinion and you don't want to hear Brother Jerry's opinion. You want to hear the word of God. If Father Jerry decides, decides to preach, Paul Peter says, let him speak as an oracle of the Lord, meaning speak in line with the written word of God. That's why I always buttress whatsoever I say with the written word of God. Very, very important. So, Correction is a way of life. Instruction is a way of life. He that, he that despises correction or instructions is actually a fool, according to the word of God. So we have had the human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them a respect. So we keep on respecting our earthly parents, though they corrected us. Shall we not much more readily be sub, uh, in subjection to the father of spirit and uh, Leave. The same way we were obedient to our earthly parents, we also need to be uh, subject to our heavenly father through the holy scripture. And if we do so, then there are so many blessings. Our life is going to be completely transformed for good. So for they indeed, for a few days, uh, chasten, the word there to chasten is to discipline, actually. Paul always refers refer to the discipline of a soldier or the discipline of an athlete. You don't beat up an athlete. You don't beat up a soldier. You give him a discipline, how he needs to wake up early in the morning, how he needs to clean his gun, make his own bed, and uh, jogging to be physically fit, how he needs to shoot a certain number of uh, rounds every day. Just for the athlete also the same thing. So that, that regime that he has been put under for a certain period of time at the end is going to yield the desired result. When we don't put discipline into anything that we are doing, we should not expect any outcome at all. If there is any outcome, it's going to be a poor outcome. Whatever you are going to sow is what you are going to reap also. So, for indeed, for a few days, for a few days, they chastened or disciplined us as it seemed best to them. But he, our heavenly father, for our prophet. Sometimes some of the things that our parents were asking us to do were unreasonable. And when we look back, uh, they those things did not even profit us at all. But still we obeyed because we were under the roof. Now, how, how much more that we now belong to the household of God, meaning we are under the roof of God. Should we not be also in subjection to our heavenly father, go through his discipline that will actually profit us, that we may be partakers of his holiness. But submitting ourselves to the disciplined instruction of the Lord, we are also going to be partakers, meaning we are going to share in his holiness. And without holiness, is going to see the Lord. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. So we are going to have his nature. We are going to have his character. The more you submit to God, the more you obey him, the more you become like him, a man of peace, a man of holiness, a man of integrity, a man or a woman of character. You become exactly like your heavenly father. The truth is every human being is created in the image and the likeness of Elohim, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That image 
and likeness of the heavenly father is already trapped in you. Now, it is dead to God. And when you are born again, it becomes alive to God again. Now, the job of uh, the church is to bring Christ uh, out so that the world can see now Christ uh, through you. So that uh, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, that you and my humble person, we are both conformed, each one of us individually, not collectively, individually, each one of us is conformed to the image of his only begotten son, Jesus. That's the true image and likeness that Christ, God wants to bring out of every one of us. So we can completely be transformed from someone that is so nasty and ugly, like a caterpillar to something that is so beautiful, like a butterfly in the name of Jesus. But it goes on to say now, no chastening or no discipline seems to be joyful or pleasant for the present, okay? But painful, you see, it is painful. A discipline that you are going to subject yourself to is going to be painful, it's not going to be pleasant, it's going to be uncomfortable. Nevertheless, afterward, it is always afterward. The, the devil wants to give you instant gratification, something that is uh, short-lived. But God is looking at the, the bigger game and the longer game. If you pay the price, you are going to enjoy it for a long time. But afterward, it, it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So whatever you desire that you've submitted yourself to according to the word of God, God said, if you want this, this is the process to get it. And you submit yourself to that process. At the end of the day, you are going to enjoy the fruit of that discipline. It's going to pay. It's going to profit you in the name of Jesus. So your tomorrow is going to be for you. In Jesus' name, Jeremiah chapter nine, chapter twenty-nine, verse eleven to verse thirteen. Jeremiah chapter twenty-nine, verse eleven to verse thirteen. The Bible says, "I know I'm not uh, ignorant, or I'm not uh, thinking about uh, your future, guessing about. I know it is already planned. So I know the thoughts that I'm thinking towards you." And they are thoughts of peace and not of evil. Shalom, the word peace, the restoration. Nothing is going to be missing and nothing is going to be broken in your life. Whatever is broken right now, God is going to fix it in the name of Jesus. So they are thoughts of peace and not of evil. He wants to give you a bright future and a hope. So your tomorrow is glorious, provided you submit yourself to the discipline of the Lord through his word. If I don't add it, people, sometimes we make promises. We tell people, hey, we don't tell them what is the tale. So your future is good, provided that's the tale. So there is the conditions of God at the back, that that's the tale. The head is the value of the promise, but the tail is actually the condition attached to that promise. Every promise of God has a condition attached to it. And uh, the church for so long, they have uh, only told the people what was the head or what was the promise, not the condition attached to it. And people, they were frustrated in a Christian life. They tried, they tried, and then at the end, they concluded it does not work. It works. So if we take, for instance, the example of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel chapter 1, they submitted themselves to the discipline, uh, the spiritual discipline, first of all, hallelujah. When a man's ways please the Lord, he's even going to make his enemies to be at peace uh, with him. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 to verse 2, the Bible says, if you diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, which he commands you to do today, then all these blessings are going to come upon you and uh, overtake you. As you continue to read that Deuteronomy chapter 28, you are going to see that he promised that you are going to be the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. People want to take the promises of God and enjoy them, but uh, cast God uh, behind the back. It won't work. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we want to preach the full gospel. Uh, whole gospel, W-H-O-L-E, 
spirit, soul, and body. I wish above all things, through the John chapter one, verse two, uh, brethren, not beloved, I wish among above all things that you prosper and be in health, even, so it is a lighter scale. It must be even, not uh, an even or all. It must be even, even as your soul. So it must be even. Your, your, your businesses and then your soul is lower here. Your relationship with God is bankrupt. That's the way Satan prospers individuals. The way in the, in the book of Exodus, uh, Pharaoh said, these people, they are idle. You need to give them so much work. Even at night, they are going to work all night to be gathering uh, straw so that uh, they are going to be so tired that they don't have time to worship God. When Satan prospers you, you don't have time to worship the Lord. When God prospers you, he makes sure that you have time to worship him. You can have a Sabbath and worship him. The prosperity that is at the detriment of your soul is never from God. That's the way Babylon prospers the people. But the prosperity that is from the Lord, it is even as your soul prospers. It is a scale. Uh, scale. So, you are prospering your health and in your relationship with God. You are prospering your finances and in your relationship with God. You are prospering your education and in your relationship with God. It, are, it is growing at the same level. It is even as your soul prospers. So Daniel, Shabrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to defile themselves with the meat that was offered to idols. Uh, by the king to drink the, the, the wine that was uh, also the king, they decided to keep themselves uh, pure. They were in the uh, around 15, 15, 16, when they went to the universities of Babylon. They stayed there for three years. So, not that they had a spiritual discipline and of praying, Daniel was praying five days, uh, five times a day. Daniel explains, and also Daniel was reading his Bible. The Bible says he, he understood by reading the books at the time of the deliverance of the Jews had come, Daniel chapter 10. So he was a man that studied his word, prayed, and also uh, he fasted also. We saw him fasting for 21 days, and also he had also the same discipline in his uh, studies. So the fact that you are praying and fast doesn't mean that you should drop your books and not read if you're in school, no. They were from a foreign land. They were from uh, Jerusalem in Israel, uh, Judea, and they were exiled or carried as uh, exiled in uh, Babylon. So they did not know the language. So they had to learn the language. God is not going to, you, you can, the book of Acts chapter two, I say again, the book of Acts chapter two, they spoke in tongues of men. And by God's grace, I have been privileged to speak in tongues of men as well. I have even interpretation, praise the Lord. I don't have a sentence or a message in tongues of men, and but it will, the tongue is going to, you are not going to be able to, converse for a whole hour, go to work and in that, in that language, you know, for, for you to do that, you need to go and study that language. So there's a discipline that you need to apply. And you may think that you are old or why should I learn again another language? Well, if you are in a foreign country, you need to learn that language and you need to go and study something so that uh, you can have a qualification, a certificate. If the system, the Babylonian system, it is still the Babylonian system, they need a certificate. Even if it is a manual uh, job, uh, plumber, go and study, have a certificate. Uh, painter, go and study in college and have a certificate. You need uh, a certificate. And Daniel, the fact that they were uh, filled with the Holy Ghost did not uh, say uh, mean that they should not go and study. They went and studied. 
is also submitted themselves to the rigor of studying through uh, the, the system of the Babylonians. If they wanted to be the, the, the governors, because the governors were taken from the cream of the nations. So it does not matter how full of the Holy Ghost you are, how much you speak. If you did not that, they will not allow you to be building bridges. To build that bridge, I know how to draw, that's fine. They're going to build that bridge and then I build that bridge is going to collapse and lots of people are going to die. No matter how you speak in tongues, they are not going to allow you to be a surgeon. Ben Carson is a wonderful Pentecostal Christian. He prays in tongues, he's a brain surgeon and many times you will uh, stand there before the, the, the patient. And when the knowledge of his medical books That, uh, does not give him the answer. Then he prays. He says, God, now show me what to do. And then the Holy Spirit directs him on what to do in that brain. And he would operate here, would operate. It doesn't even make any sense because it is not in the textbooks. And then the patient comes out fine in Jesus. But he studied, first of all, to become a neurosurgeon. And then the Holy Ghost was a plus. So we need to insist on it again, because to bring people out of uh, the, the situation, take them out of the streets, take them out of homelessness, take them out of uh, uh, drunkenness and uh, drug addiction, take them out of immigration and whatever situation they were struggling with, we need to teach them what, what the Bible says. I want to in another church. That's why I don't like going to preach in other churches uh, because sometimes the pastor, he thinks everything is only spiritual, not everything is only spiritual. We address the spirit, soul, and body. So I say to those people, because English was not the, the first language, so I say to them, you need to, they were always binding demons. I said, there are no demons here. You need to learn the language. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get the kind of job that you want. And colleges are afraid to go and learn English. You need to learn the language. Even if you want to do care, then you need to talk to the people. We, when we look at Joseph as well, he learned to be a good steward in the house of Potiphar. He learned how to administer the house of a big uh, general. At least in the house of, uh, so he learned the language as well because he was a Hebrew and there he was in Egypt. So he had to learn the language. That's why before he got into power, it took him about 13 years. He was 17 when he was uh, sold uh, as a slave and he became a prime, prime minister of Egypt at uh, the age of uh, 30, 13 years. And in that in those 13 years, he had the time to learn the language, to master the language at a good level. The reason why God put him, God has a plan for your life, a wonderful plan for your life. If you ignore where you are at right now and you see the bigger picture, God placed him in, in uh, Potiphar's house because he was a general. And there was uh, some high standing, some order uh, in that house, uh, some uh, advanced Egyptians was being uh, spoken in that uh, in that uh, house, not the slang. So he could see and build up his vocabulary, uh, know how to dress, how to speak to dignitaries, and so on and so forth. And then his another administration that he went and learned was in prison, how to rule also the worst of all the people in the land. Because when you are a prime, a prime minister, you're not just the prime minister of those who studied in Oxford and Cambridge and uh, Manchester University or Caledonia University. You also those that uh, were homeless and uh, ex-drug addicts, uh, uh, ex-cons. Also, you need to know how to manage them, how to be the leader of them. And God put him during that training in that prison. So he kept on uh, learning. 
my advice to you is not to focus on what is temporal. Your immigration situation is temporal. Your lack of employment is temporal. God is teaching you something. Open your eyes. In every season of your life, say to yourself, God, what are you teaching me? Because if you don't learn the lesson that God is trying to teach you, and you are bound to repeat the same uh, thing and you are not going to be promoted. When he had learned everything that he needed to learn, then God uh, prospered him. So when he was now prime minister, the Bible uh, tells us that uh, when his brethren came, they even did not know that he was a Hebrew because he spoke fluent Egyptians. He had mastered the language. He had the master the administration to be able to administer a whole uh, nation. And he's credited to most of the tax system that is now in the world. Why do they collect 20% from your salary? Because it's Joseph that decided to do that by the wisdom that God gave him. So you need to have some patience and learn in the name of Jesus. Now, I want you to know, contrary to the, the way the Greeks, uh, the, the philosopher like Aristotle and uh, uh, Plato, for them and the Greek philosopher is that um, your destiny is a function of your birth. That if you were born in a poor family, you are never going to amount to anything. If you were born in a gypsy family, you are never going to amount to anything. So in the West, the way we are thinking is that um, if you are born in a particular kind of family, that's it. But that's not how we think according to the word of God. According to the word of God, you can be someone that has been deported in exile like Daniel and become the governor of uh, uh, Babylon and your friend Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego exile as well, but be, become governors of different other provinces. You can be a slave like Joseph and become the prime minister of the greatest uh, nation in the world. You can be, you can be uh, also an exile like uh, Esther and become the queen of the biggest empire uh, that is uh, swaying over 127 uh, provinces from Ethiopia till India. And your uncle Mordecai, another exile, can also become the governor or the prime minister of uh, that empire. That's how we think. Your destiny is not the function of where you came from. So you need truly to stop thinking like a grasshopper, as we explained uh, uh, <laughs> the last time. When Kate Middleton married, um, uh, William, the BBC and the Channel 4, they lied to the whole nation that she was not the royalty, she was a, a commoner, that was not true. She is uh, in your lineage, one of the, the cousins, I think of 14 cousins, she has royal blood in her, otherwise they were not allowed her to marry him. But in God's kingdom, they don't play those kind of foolish games trying to deceive people. Esther had no royal blood in her, she became the queen in Jesus name. We don't look at your pedigree. We look at your connection with Christ Jesus. The greatest asset, the greatest advantage that you are going to have in life is to be born again in Jesus name. Father Abraham was the first Hebrew. Like I told you and I explained in the voice of healing, the word Hebrew is uh, one who crosses over. So Abraham, our father, the first Hebrew, he crossed over from idol worship to monotheism, where he only serves one and only one true God. He crossed from darkness. He crossed over from darkness to light. And you also can cross over from darkness to light. He crossed over from poverty. And God, when he came to God's side, God gave him riches from barrenness to becoming the father of many nations. You also can cross over. 
limitations and boundaries that people have set over you. That's what people set over you. Your destiny is not a function of your past, your place of birth, your nationality, nonsense. Your destiny is a function of the God that you have pledged allegiance to. When you crossed over from darkness to light, like Father Abraham, who became a spiritual Hebrew, a son of Abraham through Christ Jesus, then nothing became impossible. You are the only one that can stop the transformation that God wants to do in your life. So don't be afraid to leave your past behind. Abraham was not afraid to leave his past behind. There are some friends that you, are, you need to so long, bye-bye. I like that song. So long, bye-bye. There are some friends that you are going to need to wave bye-bye if you want to have the fullness of what God has in store for you in the name of Jesus. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to verse 3, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to verse 3, the Bible says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, exalted father, get out of your country from your uh, family and from your father's house. In other words, get out of your comfort uh, zone. Your future is not uh, engraved in stone. Hallelujah. Your future is not static. It's not engraved in stone so that uh, it is defined by your past, by your country of birth, by your family. No, none of that. You can actually get out of that country not just physically, but mentally as well, have a superior kind of mindset, a transformed mindset, where you no longer see yourself as a victim, no longer see yourself as a grasshopper. You can actually get out of that country, get out of that family mindset, and to a, to a land that I will show you. You may not know where you are going yet. You may not have all the details, but follow God. He's leading you to a better place so don't regret the past leave it behind as we said last wednesday so i will make you great hallelujah you are going to become a great nation in other words the other version says i'm going to make you people say oh no that's not what god said that's literally Abraham today. You say he's our father. I say no, he's our father. Ishmael was the first son. And uh, the Christians say no, through Christ Jesus, he's our father. He's the famous. Chico, uh, Daniel, Sharon, Shekhan, Abednego, they became famous. They became in the, in the foreign land, they became famous. Even if they came as uh, exile, they became famous. God made them great. God made the name great. God said, I'm going to make your name uh, Great. He made the name of Daniel great. He entered in the archive and in the chronicles of uh, the Babylonian. He made the name of Esther and of um, Mordecai great. They entered not in the chronicles of, the, of uh, Israel and Judah, but they entered in the chronicles of uh, the Persian and of the Medes. That was the greatest empire of the days under Xerxes. Who told you because you are a foreigner? that God cannot make your name uh, great. Who told you because uh, you came from a family that was in poverty that you cannot uh, become great? In Christ Jesus, all things are possible. When you cross over like Father Abraham. So I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. So God is going to use you to bless other people. When with the, the faith of the reason why God wants us to be the head and not the tail, so that we can oh, sit on the mountains of the society. So now when they want to stop the worship uh, and force us to worship also the golden calf, because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel are there, they are ready to stand. And there are people of prominence. If it was just someone that did not have a position of a power that refused to, but they would just throw him into the fire and then that's it. But because they were governors of the provinces, so when they stood against the decree of the king, it was noticed. 
And when they did not burn in the fiery furnace, then a decree on account of uh, those of three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a decree was issued for all the Jews in the realm of the Babylonian that they should not force them to be in polytheism. They should leave them alone. The God that uh, has power over the fire has proven himself that he can deliver his own people. If there's another God that can deliver the worshipers from the fire, then uh, they can come and uh, force the Jews to worship the God. But since there is no other God like uh, the God of the Jews who can deliver his worshipers from fire, they should leave those Jews alone. We should not just be doing uh, uh, church, thank God for church, but we should be in government. The reason why they abolish slavery, because uh, Wilberforce and John Newton, the slave, the former, um, how do you call it, uh, used to own a slave ship that was going to West Africa, carry, uh, taking the, 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 the slave, killing them sometime, raping them, throwing them overboard, and bringing those ones that have survived in America. Uh, he became converted to Christ and became a vicar at the Church of England. And then the young politician became converted as well to Christianity. He wanted to abandon Christianity. So Wilberforce said to him, to John Newton, John Newton said to Wilberforce, no, or vice versa. I can't remember which one was uh, the politician, which one was the priest. Uh, no, let's look at Amazing Grace. That's the, the song that the vicar wrote. Uh, Amazing Grace, it is, I think, 18 in the mission praise. Do you know which song, where is Amazing Grace in the year? Pardon? 31. 31, Amazing Grace. Okay, John Newton was the priest, Wilberforce was uh, the, the, the politician. So John Newton was the one that was owning a, a slave ship that was uh, going to take a slave in Africa and so on and so forth. So when he wrote this, uh, this uh, song, when one is talking himself as a wretched, I was lost. He's talking about what he did, all the atrocities that he committed. But because he had first hand knowledge of what they did as atrocities, so in Liverpool, in uh, London, he reproduced some of the, the scenes and brought some of the slaves and showed the back of those slaves, how they were, they were clowned by the whip, the atrocities, and uh, recounted what he used to do so that people can see. Because when you and when it is happening far away in the ocean, you don't, it doesn't affect you. You say, oh no, and you pray as a Christian. But he, he used the pictures, he, it was so vivid. And uh, Wilberforce was in the, uh, as an MP, his role in life, his destiny in life was to plead for the abolition of a slavery. Many times they rejected it. That was his life battle. And when they finally abolished slavery, he died, I think, a couple of weeks uh, later. He was so ill that uh, the day they passed the, the abolition of slavery, he was not in the house of uh, common, uh, of the Lords, I think. One of those houses where they vote the thing. And that's how slavery was abolished by Christians. So you can be wretched like he was worse than uh, Saul, John Newton. He was a murderer, rapist, but he found grace. That's why I say, uh, so when you sing Amazing Grace, uh, know the story behind Amazing Grace. There's no one who cannot cross over from darkness to light. And because of uh, Great Britain, the sun never set on uh, our empire from uh, one side of the Atlantic to the other side of the Pacific. So when now the Spanish vessels, the French vessels and the Portuguese vessel that did not want to abolish slavery, when they were in the Atlantic Ocean or in the Pacific Ocean, they would meet the British Navy. And the British Navy would capture the ship and uh, release those uh, slaves. So they were releasing them in Haiti and uh, in uh, Liberia. But that's when uh, the French king was forced to abolish because it was no longer lucrative for them because every ship that they will bring from uh, 
uh, Lagore in uh, Senegal uh, to, to go to America, the British Navy would catch those uh, ships and then uh, set free those slaves. The force didn't, France did not want to abolish it. Portugal did not want to abolish it. Spain did not want to abolish it, but because Christian stood, Christian lobbied for the abolish, uh, for, to, for slavery to be abolished, and they forced the world to change. Christianity is good, has done so much good. Islam and all the other religions, they have done nothing good. In fact, in Islam, slavery still continues today, even in Dubai, slavery still continues today. There are so many Kenyans that are slaves in Dubai. Christianity is good. When you read the Bible, you understand that God never intended for anyone to be a slave of another person. But someone needs to be in power. Someone needs to be in position in the, as an MP, as a GP. In a, we need to occupy every sphere of the society. so that we can lobby. The Jews understood it. They lobbied everywhere. In the days of Esther, when they wanted to wipe them out from the face of the earth, they learned that lesson the hard way. They started to lobby. You will see Jews in every political party, labor or Democrats, they believe them, uh, conservative, you will see Jews everywhere because they don't want uh, what happened to them in the days of Esther to happen again. Point uh, number six. The call for transformation from the caterpillar to the butterfly is to everyone and not just to some few people. So the call for transformation from a caterpillar to a butterfly is uh, to everyone, not just to some few people. Now, God called Abraham, you see, but it was not just Abraham that God was calling. God was calling everyone to live either worship, to leave the, the idolatry of Ur of the Chaldees. Everyone was called. But the truth is only Father Abraham heard and obeyed. But thank God that his nephew Lot tagged along. You can tag along as well with Father Abraham, even if you did not hear it directly. There was only one burning bush, which is Moses who heard it. But with that encounter, he went and told everybody God's plan is to set us free from slavery of Egypt, and he delivered 600,000 families. God doesn't need to appear to everyone. What he says to one, he says to all. So the call for, trans uh, for transformation is to everyone. In Genesis chapter 13, verse five to verse six, we see how also Lot who tagged along was blessed with Father Abraham. Bible tells us a lot also, Genesis chapter 13, from verse five to verse six, it says Lot also who went with Abraham, he tagged along, he went with uh, Abraham had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together for the possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. So you see, he tagged along. He said, if God is calling my uncle, I need to go with him. Uncle, where are you going? I heard the voice of the Lord. I need to leave the idol worship. I need to leave these people with the mindset that is inferior. I need to go where the Lord is leading me. Uncle, I'm tagging along. You can tag along and you are going to enjoy yeah, those blessings. You can tag along in the house of prayer for all nations and you are going to enjoy all the blessings that are in the house of prayer for all nations. Tag along. The call is for everyone. In the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28 to verse 30, Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28 to verse 30, the Bible says, uh, Jesus is saying to us, come to me. So you see, he's calling everyone, all you who labor and are heavy laden. So the call is to everyone, come to me. Don't say that some people cannot be transformed. Don't say that the lives and the destiny of some people are 
written in stones. No. God has the ability to transform them, provided they come to him, they submit to his uh, word and obey it. So come to me all, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will do what I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke. So he's going to teach us. Take my yoke upon you. So the fact that we came to Christ, uh, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. When we were in the world, we were slave of Satan and slave to sin. It was the yoke of Satan and Assyria that was around our neck choking us, and it was the burden of Assyria over our shoulders. So when we were converted, God did what? He said the yoke, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, the yoke of Assyria is going to be broken off of our neck and his burden lifted off of our shoulders because of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. So that's what he did. Unfortunately, many Christians, they think that's the end. No, that's only the beginning. Then Jesus needs to put a yoke around your neck and needs to put a burden on your shoulders to train you because your mindset is not the mindset of the kingdom. Your mind, your, fault, your thoughts are not his fault. Your ways are not his ways. By putting a yoke around your neck, he yokes you through discipleship to another fat ox that is going to train you how to plow the, the soil of your heart so that the seed of the word can be planted, but you also can build some spiritual muscles and become strong and stronger in Jesus' name. So there's a yoke in Christianity. So now, once you are set you free, when you came to him, he removed the, the, the burden of Satan, he gave you a rest. Now, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He's going to correct you. No, in the kingdom, we don't behave like this. We don't fight brethren here. Uh, we don't criticize for the sake of criticizing. He will, he's going to teach you so that you can learn from him. For I am gentle and lowly. There's no pride in here. We are gentle people. We are not rude in this house. We are gentle and lowly in heart. Hallelujah. And you will find the rest for your soul. For my yoke, the one that I'm going to place on you is easy, and my burden is uh, light. It's never going to crush you, but there is a burden. So the invitation is for everyone. So you need to be willing and obedient, and God is going to do the right. You may not understand everything, but let there be a willingness, and God is going to accept it, a willingness to be transformed, a willingness to see your life transformed, and uh, your willingness to obey. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible says it is God that works in you both to will and to do for a good pleasure. But you also need to be willing to be willing for God to work for you. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. The Bible says, if there is a first a willing mind. So you need to be willing. God is never going to force you to transform. That's why when many Christians are born again, they don't want to take the yoke of Jesus. They don't want to take uh, uh, the burden of Jesus. That's why he, they easily go back into the bondage of Satan. Because you only have one neck. And you only have two shoulders. So when the enemy sees you, God, you were saved, you were the minister deliver, deliverance, and then they broke that yoke, they removed the burden. So you started to flap your wings. I'm free. I got my marriage. I got my husband. I got my papers. I got my job. Whatever you were looking for, you are flapping your wings. I don't need any other thing. God said, no. Come, let me put a new yoke. That you can learn because another problem is coming. Satan is only going for a season. He's going to come back. So why don't you learn from me how to fight now Satan? Why don't you build some spiritual muscles so that when the enemy will come, you will see your neck has grown fat because that's what the, the yoke does. As you are plowing, you are building uh, muscles around the, your spiritual neck. And when now they put the old yoke of wood around your neck, you easily just break it off. 
when certain waves try to come back with the sea in the deep, you just break it off because your neck has become so spiritually fat. Because the fatness is the anointing or the oil is the anointing, the same Hebrew word. You built up some spiritual muscles. Sitting doesn't mess up with you anymore. You are free. Whom the son has made free is a free indeed because you've learned from him. You're not carrying the burden of Christ, not the burden of Satan. So when he comes, he tries to put his burden. You already have the burden of Christ. He cannot put another burden on you. But if you flap your wings and go back, that's why we keep on seeing the same people with the same problem because they refused to learn from Christ. They remain stagnant in their life. They were saved, but their life was never transformed. They are still mean. They are still rude. There is no gentleness in them. There is no loneliness, full of pride. They've never taken the yoke of Jesus. They've never taken the burden of Jesus to learn from him. How gentle he is. How low, uh, lowly of heart he is. My prayer is that uh, none of us we stay like that. We will be willing. And when there is that willingness of mind, it is accepted. It is according to what one has. Even if you don't know anything, well, God, we start with that John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world. Even when I came to Christ, I didn't even know John 3, 16. So you are better off because at least you know John 3, 16. I remember when I came to the Manchester church, my pastor that led us to Christ back home, he did not teach us to memorize scriptures. But when I came among my brethren, uh, the Nigerian, they were good at uh, quoting scriptures. So when they asked me, I joined the prayer team, they asked me, uh, what is John 3.16? I said, I don't know John 3.16. And the brother was so rude, he said, what? They're allowing anybody now in, in, in the prayer team. What kind of prayer? Someone even does not know John 3.16. It hurt me for so long that I refused on purpose for 10 years to learn John 3.16. When I would read it, I would refuse to memorize it just because of the harsh words of that brother. But you are better off. At least you know John 3, 16. So it is according to what one has and not according to what one does not have. With the little knowledge of the word of God that God is going to, that you already have, God is going to use it and build up on it in Jesus' precious name. So the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, it says that, if you are willing and obedient, what will happen? You shall eat the good of the land. So whatever uh, you want, be it in your career, uh, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they were willing and they were obedient to submit to the educational system. They went through it. And at the end, with the help of God as well, they became the head. Uh, another day became governors of the most, um, uh, of the key uh, provinces, of the uh, empire of Babylon. And so it is also for you. If you are willing to go through any process in your place of work, if you are willing to put up the work, you are going to be promoted. There are no secrets. Only in corrupt regimes that they are going to promote people that are not putting the work. And that's why those countries, they don't, they don't work. Wherever there is corruption, why they put people that don't deserve? because they did not do any work. They put them in place, those countries that they don't work. Look at any country where they are encouraging laziness, they are encouraging uh, entitlement, they are encouraging nepotism. Those countries are always poor because for a business to be, even the business of the economy of the country to be successful, you need to put people who merit those, uh, uh, appointments in the church as well. You need to put people that have paid the price in studying the word of God, in praying. That's when you will see the God moving in those churches. There is a price to pay everywhere. There's a discipline to submit to everywhere. There is a learning curve everywhere in church as in government and so on and so forth. As in your place of work as well, there's a learning curve. And any company that would violate that process, that company is not going to work, that family is not going to work, that business is not going to, that the church is not going to increase spiritually, numerically, it's not going to be able to increase. In power, it is not going to be able to increase either. So, 
So my prayer is that uh, we are all going to depart from uh, yesterday because our future is great. Where God is taking us, it is marvelous. We are all going to depart from our comfort zone, what is familiar to us, because a lot of us are afraid to depart from our comfort zone, to depart from what is familiar to us. Abraham uh, left everything behind. and went to a place that God was going to show him. So follow the leading of God based on the written word of God, because God is going to transform your life. He's going to bless you, make you a source of blessings to other people in the mighty name of Jesus. Point number seven. Point number seven is uh, communicate uh, your God-given uh, vision. So, for the transformation also to happen, you will need to be able to communicate that God-given vision to the people around you. You need to be convinced of uh, that vision that God gave you, that future that uh, you are hearing uh, that is possible, that kind of transformation from a butterfly from a caterpillar to a butterfly, then you need to be able to communicate that vision to the people around you. So the most powerful instrument or the most powerful organs uh, God has uh, placed in each one of us, uh, there are three actually. It's our mind, our heart, and our tongue. Our mind, our heart, and our tongue. So we will need those three to agree. Read the Bible study on the power of confession. My job here today, by the help of the Holy Ghost, is to inform your mind. Is to inform your mind. Because my people, they perish for lack of knowledge. You'll see at chapter 4, verse of, uh, 6, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 and 33. Daniel 11, 32 and 33. The people who know the Lord the God, they are going to be strong and they are going to carry out mighty exploits. And those among the people who have uh, understanding, they are going to be able to instruct the others. So that's what I'm doing. I'm informing your mind. So your job is now through the information that you have received of the word of God, you need to deliberately choose to renew your mind. I used to think like this yesterday. No, I no longer see myself as a grasshopper, finished. I no longer accept that I'm a stupid. God does not make anyone that is stupid. I have the mind of Christ and I have the spirit of excellency. I can do all things for Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I'm not a failure. He always leads me to triumph and through me diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. I need to deliberately choose based on the information that I've been uh, uh, supplied with to renew my mind. And when I choose to renew my mind, the second thing that I need to do is uh, to believe that word in my heart. Because there needs to be uh, my mind and my heart, they need to synchronize. Hallelujah. That what is here is now what is here. What is here is now what is here. So when I've been informed of the possibilities uh, that are in the kingdom of heaven, uh, how God sees me, the future that God has for me, the thoughts that he's thinking towards me, I choose to have those a superior thoughts because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So I choose to have those high thoughts, those high ways in the name of Jesus. People are going to say to you, what do you make yourself out to be? Who do you think you are? Because you refuse to fly with them uh, to be like the chicken. You choose not to be like an eagle. Soaring far above the storms of life. So as you renew your mind, you need to believe it in your heart. So change the way you believe in your heart as well. The Bible says, because if you don't change what you are believing in your heart, if it is only your head knowledge, 
but not your heart knowledge. You need to switch from head knowledge to heart knowledge. It starts with the head knowledge, and then you need to believe it in your heart. If you don't switch to the heart knowledge, if you don't believe the right in your heart, you are going to limit what the Holy One of Israel can do for you. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, he says, as he thinks, in his heart, so is he. So as a man thinks in his heart, as a woman thinks in her heart, so is he. You cannot uh, become greater than what uh, the thoughts of your hearts are. Brother Jerry can inform me that there is a bright future for you. But in your heart, you believe there's a bright, God has a bright future, but not for me. Maybe for someone else then you are going to limit the Holy One of Israel for what you can do. Many times we pray for people. They are saying the right thing, but we are not seeing what is in the heart. Those are three needs to align. Think, believe, speak. So Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. The Bible says, guard your heart with all the diligence. So guard, put like a gate, the fence around it. Like a Faraday cage, I've, I think I've uh, given, uh, that was last year, like Faraday cage. We even know there's a lightning coming against that Faraday cage. Even if, if you are inside that Faraday cage, no lightning can uh, strike you. No matter how high that voltage is, you are insulated from a lightning. So put like that the Faraday cage around your heart. Guard your heart with all the diligence. Why? Because out of it springs the issues of life. The word issues, there is the boundaries and the limitations. The boundaries and the limitations that you have in your life are determined by the way you are thinking in your, you are believing in your heart. As a man thinks in his heart, as you are believing in your heart, that's what is causing the limitations. Some people, they would give you a good lecture, but the truth is they don't believe what they say. They don't believe a single word of what they've taught. And even Bible colleges, there are teachers that teach the Bible. They teach you the Greek in Manchester University. They teach you the Hebrew from the Bible. So you go to the, the universe, Manchester University, the uh, great Manchester University, study theology there. They are going to teach you the Hebrew, the Greek, how to, uh, to search the, the, the scriptures for the concordance and the meaning of words. But those teachers, they don't believe in Jesus themselves. None of them is saved. So you can teach it even yourself. The Pharisees, Jesus said about the Pharisees, they sit in the seat of Moses. They are teaching you the right thing. Whatever they tell you to do, do it. But they, you, they are teaching it, but they themselves, they don't do it. If you don't do it, it means that you don't believe it yourself. When we know that we know that you believe in something when you become a doer of it, not just a hearer, deceiving yourself. So after you've, been, uh, you, you've renewed your mind with the information that was supplied, you've believed in your heart so that uh, you've removed all those restrictions of boundaries that were around you, the limitations, and then you need to say it and do it. The Bible, the, the first thing is to, to, to say it now. You need to share your vision with people. Hallelujah. You need to share your vision with your family, with your children, where you are going. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible says, since we have the spirit of faith. So if you truly have the spirit of faith or belief, if you believed it. Since we have not, if, since you need to believe that that spirit is already in you. If you are still struggling, do I have faith or do I not have faith? Faith has nothing to do with uh, feelings. You have the spirit of uh, faith. We all have received the measure of faith, Paul says. That one is explaining the application of the perfect redemption plan, but time will fail us. So everything that I teach, the foundation is all those uh, 32 books. And I'm only building on uh, those uh, foundations. So we all have the measure of faith. So having that in mind, so Paul says, since, not if, not when we will receive the spirit of faith, we have 
the spirit of faith. And according to what is written, I believe, therefore, I, I believe, therefore, I spoke. So we also in this 21st century, not just like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Joseph, Abraham. No, we also in this 21st century, here in the house of prayer for all nations, individually, we also believe, therefore, we do what we speak. The reason why I opened my mouth and I said there are 300,000 families that are going to be saved because I believe, therefore, I need to speak it out. I don't care whether people believe it or not, how many people are in Glasgow. Uh, when God said to Abraham, I'm going to make your father of many nations, he looked, his, the, and he changed his name from Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, father of many nations. So his wife from Sarah, I pray, um, to Sarah, a princess of 18 or 19, like the lady died when she got married to Prince Charles. So in the field, she would call him Abraham, father of many nations. And he would say in a, in a response, Sarah, my princess of 19 years old. So people were making fun of them. Are you sure they've not lost it? I think when you get around 90 years old for his wife and 100 years old, you, you suffer. Definitely you're suffering from dementia. That's why you are seeing her as a 19 and she's seeing you. <laughs> well, she's being delusional because she thinks think that you have many children when you don't even have one egg. But since we have the same spirit of faith, we are seeing nations. So I believe, therefore I speak. Our job now, if you believe, you need to see yourself as the head. I'm going to graduate from that college in the name of Jesus. I'm not a failure. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm going to get that job in the name of Jesus. I'm going to get that promotion in the name of Jesus. It applies in every aspect of life. I'm going to get married in the name of Jesus in every, if that's your desire, in every aspect of life in the name of Jesus. And God is going to use your tongue. He's going to use your tongue. So you may start like Father Moses. You are not eloquent. You say, well, God, you know, I, I, I cannot properly articulate my uh, vision, the vision that you have given unto me. I cannot properly articulate uh, uh, the plans that you have for the church. I'm not eloquent. Everybody started somewhere, but you are going to get better at it in the name of Jesus. The thing is you need to communicate. In your place of work, money is with communication. If you don't communicate your idea, then you cannot be promoted. There's not a head of department that is silent. The head of department need to lead others. When you do work, you need to be able to explain what the work you've done. So you need to communicate in every aspect of life. You need to communicate if you want to make money. You do care, but you need to communicate with uh, the, the patients. So that's why timidity or fear, the French rendering says God, the first, second uh, Timothy chapter one, verse seven, God has not given us a spirit of timidity. The English rendering says God has not given us a spirit of fear. Uh, but the two are correct. The Hebrew word, that, the Greek word that is there is a timidity is fear as well. So timidity and the fear, being shy is not of the Lord. Because the enemy doesn't want you to speak. He wants you to keep quiet, to think that I think nobody is going to consider my opinion. Nobody is going to even value what I have to say. You have something to say, and it is important. People need to hear what you have to say. When Jesus was baptized, the voice came from the excellent glory and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So God also is saying to the world around you, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. God is well pleased with you as well. Hear him, hear her. You have something to say. You have something to contribute in the society. So speak your mind. Don't be rude about it, but speak your mind. And you are going to be amazed at how people are going to take your ideas on board. You are wise because the prince of peace, Christ Jesus, is there the author of wisdom, is there, he dwells in you. So in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 to verse 12, in Exodus chapter 4, 
verse 10 to verse 12, we have Moses having an encounter with the Lord. The Bible says, then Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech uh, and uh, slow of tongue. He was a stammerer. Okay, God is going to teach you. You're not the first stammerer. You're not the first that is not eloquent. So the Lord said to, to him, who has made a man's mouth? So God who made a mouth is going to teach you. He said, I'm going to put my word in your mouth. But you can plant heaven on earth. Read a blessed read of a prayer. So God is going to give you divine insight, wisdom from above. When you're going to speak, you say, wow, where did she get that kind of wisdom? And Jesus did say, where did he get that kind of wisdom? He's not the son of the carpenter. You're going to have divine wisdom in your place of work. You're going to be able to solve problems that no one else could solve. So who made man's mouth? Or who has made the mute or the deaf, the deaf or the seeing and the blind? If I not the Lord, now therefore go. I'm telling you to go. I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. God is going to teach you how to speak, how to prepare the prayer point for the prayer meeting. He's going to teach you. He's going to be with your mouth. Stop panicking. Stop freezing as if you're, you are going to die because you are standing before an, an audience. No. God is with you. He has not given you any spirit of timidity. Because to make money, you need to talk. In your place of work, you need to talk. To, have, to advance, you need to talk. To present your project, you need to talk. To preach the gospel, you need to talk. How can they be saved if they've not heard the, the, uh, the word of God? If, how can they hear without a preacher? So you need to talk. So it is really of the devil to try to put that timidity, shyness in you that I cannot talk. And the same Moses, we see him in the book of Deuteronomy. The same one who said that he could not talk, he was uh, not eloquent. We see him in the book of Deuteronomy for a whole month. He's speaking to the new generation, telling them what to do. He taught them the book of uh, Deuteronomy for a whole month. Every day, he told them, this is, you are going to possess the land, I'm going to die. So... Uh, but I'm not going to go with you. Joshua is going to go with you. Let me tell you what you should do now. He did not, there was no mention of him being a stammerer, him not being eloquent, or him not being uh, um, articulate enough. No mention of that was made in the book of Deuteronomy. So God is going to train you. He's going to be with your mouth. He's going to uh, Polish you in the name of Jesus. He polished uh, Joseph. He could not stand before kings. He polished uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, they were exiled. Joseph was uh, a slave. He put them in a position of power. They will polish you in Jesus' name. You're going to be able to stand before great uh, people in the name of Jesus. As you keep on serving the Lord, God has uh, locked greatness uh, in you. There is a great potential that has been uh, planted in you by your heavenly father. Now he wants to release it. He wants to transform your life completely from uh, a caterpillar to a butterfly in Jesus' uh, precious name. Uh, so there's a point eight, but I want to touch it, uh, but we will stop here. That point eight is going to be for myself. In Jesus' precious name. So, is there any question? Alison, do you have a question? No, I've, I've not got any questions tonight. Thanks, Pastor. Thank you. Lulu, do you have any question? Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, in terms of sharing your dreams, as you said, uh, for people to catch it and run with it or to support your dream, I guess we have to be careful on who we share it with. Also in terms of families, it's not everybody who will be able to come on board. That's another teaching. <laughs> 
that is another teaching. That's the wisdom of how being how knowing how to be discreet. But when I talk about sharing the vision, the, the, your God given vision, uh, if for instance God says to you that uh, you need to be a carer, okay, but you don't know how to go about it, then you need to talk to some to some people. I think I, I want to go. It doesn't need to. When I say about the vision, I don't say that uh, God showed you something that I know. Even the hard desires that you have to achieve something, you need to, to talk to some people that you can trust, okay? Uh, that can that love you and that can guide you as well, ask for information. And then they're going to be able to tell you, actually, you can start by doing those online courses of uh, uh, I care TV, uh, care TV or whatever. Uh, get the world certificate and start applying there uh, in those uh, care agencies. So they pointed you to the right uh, place. Uh, you did some uh, food and hygiene certificate and manual handling. These are the two first certificates that you need to, to start uh, running immediately. And then the rest, uh, they will train you inside uh, that uh, thing. So you pointed that person to the right place. Even for little, little things like that, I want to study medicine, okay? So show me your grades. If a, a child says, that's why we need to be friends with our children, we need to, uh, whatever the vision they have, they need to share with us. Habakkuk chapter two, verse uh, one to verse four, I will set my watch on the rampart and see what the Lord is going to say to me. And if he uh, says something to me, then I'm going to correct myself. So I'll write down the vision and make it plain that in the wrong or reason because the vision for an appointed time and though it tarries, wait for it because at the end it's going to speak for itself. The just shall live by faith, but the proud in his heart is uplifted. So you, as you write down the way, okay, my son, you want to study medicine, you want to study dentistry, you want to be a pharmacist, okay. Uh, uh, what the majors that you have chosen in, in your higher are not the right ones. So you need to switch. You cannot be doing literature and you want to be a pharmacist. It's not going to work. Uh, so you need to switch to uh, biology, to physics, uh, chemistry, biology, and some maths if you want to be uh, medical doctor, a pharmacist, and so on and so forth. And then, okay, you're having a C uh, in uh, biology, a C in chemistry. I know my son, you need to do, um, we need to get you a tutor. Well, I, I want to have my, my special time. So no, with those kind of grades, you are never going to be accepted in uni for pharmacy or for, for medicine. So we need to get you some tutors. You need to sacrifice. You see, whatever you want to do, there's a pain. Discipline is not pleasant at first. So we are going to cut on your gymnastic. We are going to cut on your rugby so that uh, we can put now three hours of tutoring that week, every week, so that we can uh, take your grades a bit higher to have at least a B plus or A, so that we, we are guaranteed to have uh, First choice in medical school, dentist, dentistry school, and pharmacy. So we actually plan. This is not just we just pray, pray, pray. No. So you need to, the, the safest place is uh, with, uh, for children is with the parents. That's why you need to be involved in what your children are doing. We have to guide them to train, and that's another teaching, but we are going to get there one day. I have all of them written somewhere. That's our job as parents. We don't just leave them and hope that they are going to, to, to turn up okay. They are not going to turn up okay. They are like arrows. We need to shoot in the church as well, the same thing. The people are spiritual children. And it's the role of the, the pastor to prepare the food, to give them new visions, to renew the mind so that they can be shot in their destinies. So though I'm sharing a vision as a seed, but what is happening is the Holy Spirit now is speaking to each one of you, okay, I think I can achieve this. I think I can achieve this. And then you take action. You then go either to college, you go either to, to get a job, you go either to study, you, you both spiritually, physically, uh, materially, financially, we teach in every aspect of life as a seed. So we cast the vision of God for the life of everyone 
And then everyone now applies it in his own personal uh, case. And if they have a question and they ask, well, how can I do it? And oh, they go and pray to God as well. God, give him clarity about uh, this thing. When, for instance, Sister Esther wanted to start the business, okay, she was a nurse. We prayed, we prayed, and then God said to her, she needs to start the business. Okay, God said to her, you need to go to, to uni. So she went to uni. And after two years, God said to her, you need to stop. I did not send you there to, to have a bachelor in business just so that you can know how business works and then go start. So she came and told me, I said, God said, quit. So you, she quit. So she stopped a uh, bachelor that she was doing uh, in Manchester University and started out the business. So God directed, but she shared the vision. And uh, by the grace of God, I was able to guide, 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 guide. But you share even with people that you trust in the name of uh, Jesus, your family. She doesn't share with your family members. <laughs> they did not believe uh, in her. But now that they've seen the result, uh, it has uh, helped. When the sister say, uh, the twin sister started the, the, the source business, I was talking with them on uh, WeChat, which is a Chinese app um, that is like WhatsApp. If you want to watch it, bigger than it's WhatsApp and Google together. It's all about the Chinese version. So I was speaking with them, and then I saw I saw the shop in the vision. So I described I showed the, the rest. I described the they were doing some renovation. So they said, "Do you know that we have a restaurant?" I said, "I don't know, but this is what I see." How do you know that we are doing a renovation of the restaurant? I said, "That's what I see." So then I went to see them. We started to pray about uh, because they were one of them was uh, had the MBA and the other one um, was a lawyer. So they wanted to close the family restaurant and go back to their respective professions. I said no, you shouldn't. Your, your grandfather started it. Uh, your grand, your father had it, and now he wants to retire seventy. So you need to take the family business. But we are we are going to make less money than uh, in our own careers. So we pray. So God opened our eyes how we can do it. To get the money and then God showed me the source. I said, then, okay, that source. That's where the money is. The miracle is always in the house. You had a traditional source that they were using their own, their own recipe. So that's where the money is. So we prayed and then decided to do that the tradition, uh, um, at, uh, manually, even labeling the bottles. Uh, uh, with their own hands, they produced about a thousand bottles. They sent it to Tesco, and then we prayed again. God gave us new ideas uh, how to make it uh, gluten free, and uh, so many other things. We ended up producing about 12 uh, different uh, flavors, uh, nut free, though it has uh, the, the flavor of nuts, but it has no nuts in it. Uh, though it is a uh, sweet, but it has no uh, sugar in it, so that people that have diabetes can eat it. People that are allergic to nuts can also eat it. And as we are doing Bible study every Thursday in, in the office, uh, the lawyer office of uh, Helen, and eating the food, we are also praying for God to give us ideas for business. I think like a business. My people, many people think that uh, <laughs> I'm a business. I study the business. But if you read this book, this Jewish book, the Bible, you will see business everywhere. Business of the kingdom, business of life, in every aspect of life. So God is going to direct, direct, and today the rest is the story. They are multi-millionaires. And by God's grace, Helen also is married now. Lisa also is married. They all have now their own daughters. So God perfected everything that pertained to the life and the godliness. So you will need still to share the one of the Lord spoke to me. I shared the vision uh, with my, my pastor back home. You, that's why you need, you need to have friends in life, true friends that believe in what you believe, that will not criticize you or kill your faith. And uh, once I you write the Bible study, I did not say to many people that I was writing them. Uh, but uh, when I finished writing them, I said uh, to Lynn and Kelvin, I gave it to Lynn and Kelvin. Lynn and Kelvin know a lot of things that a lot of other people don't know because they are like parents to me. And they believed that, that God uh, spoke it and then they run with the vision. So 
you still need to communicate that vision because you will not be able to achieve it alone. Nobody's an island. That's not the truth. And God makes it in that way so that we can depend on one another. I need you. You need me in Jesus' name. And we need uh, Jesus. That's why the, one of the plans of the enemy is to cause a division between brethren, true brethren that uh, God placed in your life so that uh, when you fight over something, you part ways and then you are not able to, to accomplish what the Lord asks you to do. And they also are not able to accomplish what the Lord asks them to do. One of the weapons of the enemy is uh, division in uh, the body of Christ. But when there is unity according to uh, Psalm 133, the anointing is going to flow from the head of Aaron down his beard to his garment. That's how the Lord is going to command uh, the, the blessing to everyone. And uh, you are going to be blessed, and each one of us is going to become a source of blessing uh, to one another in Jesus' uh, precious name. I will help you fulfill your vision. You are going to help another person fulfill their vision in the name of Jesus. So shall it be. And if uh, you share the vision, okay, I will sit down. What I can, if I, even if I cannot give them the money, I can write uh, the reference in the name of Jesus. And through that reference of character reference, some people, they've never worked. So they cannot have a, a work reference. Okay, so they are, okay, ask for a character reference. So when I write, I sit down and I pray, I say, okay, God, let me write a wonderful character reference. And then they give them the job, though they have a year experience. The company accepts to train them on the job because of the character reference that they've given. So we are a blessing to one another, but if you don't share that vision, how will they even help you for the character reference? Many people are suffering in silence because they are afraid. You should not be afraid that everybody is going to betray you. You need to pray. God, guide me to the people that are mature now, that are not going to envy me, to be uh, jealous. I know some projects or some people that some projects are in 50 million pounds, even more, but they are able to show me the project because. I will not even ask them for 1% of the money that I see. People have a lot of problems, but they say, if I show them that I have 50 million pounds, will they ask me for a tithe? <laughs> Thank God I can raise my hand in an off those people have never given even one pound to Brother Jerry, not even one pound to the house of prayer for nations. People need to know that you have done nothing in their life and so shall it be. So God will direct you the right people that you can share your burden with in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time. We want to give you all the glory for the fact that you are teaching us your secrets. And I pray that uh, as we learn them and we become doers of them, that you are going to help us to transform our life, to renew our life, because you have deposited such great potential in each one of us. And we don't want to waste it. Uh, we don't want to limit what the Holy One of Israel is uh, desirous, uh, uh, is wanting to do in the life of each one of us. And I pray, my King and my Savior, we will be willing to go through the process of transformation. Though it might be painful and unpleasant at first, but uh, we know at the end it is going to yield the desire, the fruit, be it spiritually, physically, maritally, financially, in every aspect of life is going to yield the desired fruit. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you very much.